All right, everyone. Uh, hello and welcome to the September 2020 Rocky Mountain Railroad Club meeting with our guest presenter this month, Justin Franz from Montana. Um, hopefully you were all able to connect without any problems and the video is flowing just fine. It's a little bit of an experiment. I'm visiting family this week back in, on the farm in Iowa, so I'm running this off my laptop via cell phone. So uh, tests all look good, so hopefully it's not an issue. All right, so um, with that, it looks like the YouTube stream is up and running, so everybody should be able to see us there as well. And I will hand it over to uh, our president and vice president, uh, Dave and Denny. Go ahead, Denny. Good evening. I'm Denny Leonard, and uh, this is Dave Scharf with me, and we are coming from uh, wonderful uh, North Denver. And uh, I think this is our fourth uh, uh, Zoom meeting, and it's kind of hard to know how many more we're going to have because certainly we want to go back to some live meetings. But uh, we're also YouTubing this, so I know there's a couple of members that are watching this on YouTube. Uh, if you want to comment and ask questions, of course, you have to come to our Zoom meeting. But in any case, welcome to everybody, and uh, it's uh, wonderful that with technology we've continued to be able to go forward with our uh with our meetings and we've had i think some some really good meetings quite frankly and look forward to this one very much too so um welcome our our presenter um we um are uh, continuing to uh, publish the rail report as everybody knows and and there's tons of information in that and i ask uh, uh, anybody that's got any ideas to continue to contribute to that and um Anyway, uh, for what our uh, near future looks like, we won't have the dinner this year, obviously, but uh, we will. Uh, I'm hoping maybe by Christmas we can get back together again, but we'll see what happens. So anyway, I'm going to turn over to Dave because he's got the uh, prognosis for the next couple of meetings and a couple other announcements to share with you. Uh, OK, this. Yeah. If we were at an in-person meeting, we'd uh, we'd do introductions and we'd have people raise their hand with any little announcements. But uh a couple of things I can think of is uh, some of you may know that uh, Burlington Northern Santa Fe has uh, made 10 sort of special logoed 25th anniversary diesel units. Uh, they're starting to trickle around the system right now. One of them came through Denver uh, over the weekend. They're kind of an interesting tribute to the uh, former railroads, some of which Justin will even talk about. Um, we had uh, our program last month kind of revolved around Como. Uh, they've made some more track progress in the last couple of weeks. They've been kind of having work days up there every other weekend. Um, later this month, they're gonna actually move out one of the gondolas that's been up there that was privately owned by Jason Midyad. It's gonna go uh, down to the Ridgeway folks, I think for their museum. And then uh, also from the Western slope of Colorado, Another rare CNS uh, boxcar will probably be moving to Como later this month. I believe that they uh, they talked about that a little bit last month. Um, I don't have an announcement yet for the presenter for our October meeting, but I can tell you that uh, our November guest presenter will be Ed Dickens um, of the STEAM program in Cheyenne. Uh, we, we don't know exactly the topic of his uh, program, but you can look for the, forward to that in a couple of months. Um, and I think afterward, we will probably take some questions. Some of our actual members are online on the uh, Zoom call, and so we'll probably talk a little more afterwards. Right now, I guess I may as well uh, introduce Justin Franz up in uh, Whitefish, Montana, and he can tell us about his uh, presentation. All right, can you hear me? All right, cool. Well, thank you so much for, for inviting me uh, and, and allowing me to share some of my work with you guys tonight. Uh, my name is Justin Franz. I'm a, a writer and photographer in Whitefish, Montana, born and raised in uh, Augusta, Maine, but I've lived out in Montana for the last uh, 10 years. Uh, I'm the associate editor of Rail Fan and Railroad Magazine. Uh, had that job for the last uh, five or six months. And prior to that, I was a newspaper reporter uh, in Kalispell covering uh, Northwest Montana uh, as a writer and a photographer. Uh, I moved up here in 2011 for an internship at that newspaper. 
thought it would be three months and ended up being nine years now. And uh, a big focus of my photography over the last decade has been uh, the Great Northern Railway uh, and, and what happened to its main line, part of which remains uh, BNSF's primary Northern Transcon to the Pacific Northwest in Seattle and Portland, and uh, another part of which uh, is now operated by a short line. And so this is a, a version of a program that I, I presented at the Center for Air Photography and Art about um, uh, back in April for their virtual conversations. This has been updated with some recent photography um, and, and sort of goes through the history of uh, history of rarity in this part of the, the Rocky Mountains. So with that, I will try and figure out how to share my screen. All right, here we go. Let's see. Hopefully that is coming through clearly. <laughs> So, and if there's any, any problems, just, uh, <laughs> just stop me. Um, but anyway, so on, on January 2nd, 1892, 3,500 people gathered in downtown Kalispell, Montana, a dusty little town in the northwest corner of the state, to celebrate the arrival of the Great Northern Railway. For months, the townspeople had nervously been waiting to find out where exactly the Great Northern's transcontinental railroad would cross the lush Flathead Valley. They were anxious because the arrival of a transcontinental railroad in that era would put any town, even this town, on the map. But on this cold winter day, there was no longer any doubt where the Great Northern was building its track. Kalispell was about to become a railroad town. To mark the monumentous occasion, a local community club had gathered silver dollars and melted them down to make a silver spike that would be ceremoniously hammered, hammered into the ties just as they had done in Promontory, Utah, 23 years earlier at the completion of the first Transcontinental Railroad. After the first train steamed into town, hundreds of track builders joined thousands of townspeople to parade through the streets on their way to a banquet. A reporter for the Salt Lake Tribune described the scene like this. The citizens are justly enthusiastic over the advent of the Great Northern. Bands played upon the streets all afternoon repeatedly serenading the railroad officials and their sturdy crews. Tonight, the city is ablaze with bonfires and colored lights that can be seen in every quarter of the city. This is a red letter day for the metropolis of the Flathead Valley, one long to be remembered by everyone who witnessed the demonstration. But the celebration would not last long. Within a decade, the track through Kalispell would be nothing more than a branch line after the Great Northern found a better route through the area. What happened in Northwest Montana serves as a microcosm for what happened all across the American West during the 19th, 20th, and even 21st centuries, as railroads altered their routes, usually in search of more business or easier grades, the fortunes of towns along those lines could change almost overnight, creating a mosaic of winners and losers changing map of the Great Northern Railway in Northwest Montana has been a focus of my photography over the last 10 years. And in many ways, it is a tale of two railroads. In 2011, I graduated from the University of Montana with a degree in print journalism and took an internship at a newspaper in Kalispell, Montana. I thought that internship would last a summer, but a decade later, I'm still here. In that time, I've become fascinated with the history of the Great Northern, its role in the development of nearby Glacier National Park, and the fate of its two successors here, BNSF Railway, which still uses the former Great Northern Main Line over Marias Pass as its primary route to the Pacific Northwest, and a short line, Watco's Mission Mountain Railroad, that has picked up once important pieces of the railroad that have been cast off by the Class One. But before we get to those images, a little bit of history. The Great Northern Railway was the brainchild of the infamous railroad baron James J. Hill. The Canadian-born Hill had initially made his money in shipping and coal, but after the Civil War, he began to look and to, began to invest in railroads. Hill and a group of investors purchased the St. Paul and Pacific Railroad in 1879, and Hill became its general manager. Over the next decade, Hill expanded his railroad throughout the Midwest, 
But by the mid 1880s, he realized that in order to remain relevant, he needed to build west. In 1887, track layers began to work west from Minot, North Dakota, extending the railroad, by then renamed the Great Northern, into Montana. Once he arrived at the foot of the Rockies, Hill had two choices. He could save time and money and purchase the Northern Pacific, which despite having completed its own transcontinental route a few years earlier, was in financial trouble, or he could build his own route west. For many years, there had been a rumor of a low mountain pass just south of the Canadian border that was used by the Blackfeet tribe to cross the continental divide. But as of the late 1880s, no Anglo-American had mapped it, although legend has it they had come close years earlier. In the 1850s, Congress had appropriated $150,000 to the War Department to survey four routes west for a transcontinental railroad. Engineer James Doty was assigned to survey the northern route and in 1854 was reportedly exploring the eastern half of what is today Glacier National Park. Doty apparently found what he believed was the eastern slope of what would eventually be called Marias Pass. He excitedly reported back to Washington, D.C. that he had found an ideal crossing of the northern Rockies. Doty argued that if he had more time and money he could confirm his discovery the following year. However, according to legend, James Doty was told to come back east because Secretary of War Jefferson Davis, who would eventually become president of the Confederate States of America, preferred a more southern route and would not approve the exploration of a predominantly northern route. The Marias Pass would go un, unfound for another 20 years, or 20 or 30 years, until 1889, when James J. Hill sent engineer John F. Stevens into the wilderness with the goal of finding Marias Pass. Stevens was no stranger to plotting mountain railroads, having previously engineered the Canadian Pacific and parts of the Rio Grande. According to a story later promoted by the Great Northern, Stevens and a native guide headed east into the mountains from what is today Browning, Montana in December 1889. Not far from what they suspected was the east slope of Marias Pass, the native guide fell ill and announced that he could go no further. Stevens continued alone. Not long after, Stevens found a wide spot in the mountains and a creek that flowed west, confirming that this was indeed Marias Pass. But Stevens' adventure had only just begun. According to legend, Stevens was trapped in a storm and had to build a fire to survive a night with temperatures that dipped to 40 below. The following morning, after the storm had passed, Stevens headed back east and found his native glide clinching to life. Stevens aided the man back to health, got him back to Browning, and then continued to east to report to James J. Hill that he had found a new Northwest Passage that would soon become the route of the Great Northern's main line to the Pacific Northwest. By the way, you'll note that I said, according to legend a few times in that, that last bit. That's because the story of John F. Stevens' ordeal comes from a book published by the Great Northern in 1925 as part of their marketing efforts for Glacier National Park. I'm not saying the story is not true, but I will say that great, the Great Northern's marketing team in that era was not afraid to exaggerate the truth in their efforts to promote the railroad and its passenger trains. Perhaps the most famous example of these fibs was when the railroad hired a taxidermist here in Whitefish to add fur to a trout so that they could spread a story about how the waters of Glacier National Park were so cold, fish had to grow fur to survive. Getting back to our story, a year after Stevens mapped Marias Pass, the Great Northern was laying track up and over the Continental Divide. By January 1892, they had reached Kalispell, Montana, and a year later, a final spike was driven in the Cascade Mountains at scenic Washington, completing James J. Hill's dream of a transcontinental railroad. Two other railroads built main lines to the Pacific Northwest. The Milwaukee Road, which has now been abandoned for more than 40 years, and the Northern Pacific, which in Montana and Idaho is now Montana Rail Link. 
but perhaps the route that has fared the best of the three northern transcontinentals is the Great Northern, which today serves as BNSF Railway's primary route to the Pacific Northwest. But like the Milwaukee Road and the Northern Pacific, the Great Northern across Montana has also seen its fair share of change in recent decades. The Great Northern's original main line through Northwest Montana passed through Columbia Falls and Kalispell and Libby, closely following the path taken by US Highway 2 seen at the bottom of this map. But 10 years after thousands of people gathered in downtown Kalispell to celebrate the Great Northern's arrival in the Flathead Valley, the railroad decided that it was tired of moving freight over a stiff mountain grade called Haskell Pass, halfway between Kalispell and Libby. So it began to survey a new route through the area that would bypass Kalispell. Initially, the Great Northern hid its intentions by saying that it was only surveying a route through the northern part of the Flathead Valley to reach for it to look because it was looking for a branch into the coal fields of British Columbia and Alberta. But soon locals realized that the Great Northern was preparing to leave town. The new route headed west from Columbia Falls and went through Whitefish and Eureka before reconnecting with the original main line near Libby. The 15 or so miles from Columbia Falls to Kalispell would become a branch in the original main line between Kalispell and Libby, which went up and over Haskell Pass, would be abandoned. Years later, the construction of a hydroelectric dam near Libby would result in another relocate, line relocation, which included the creation of the Flathead Tunnel seen in the middle of this map. Following the 1904 line relocation, the Kalispell Division headquarters were moved 15 miles north to Whitefish, and almost overnight, the community of Kalispell lost more than 200 jobs. According to the newspapers, quote, a great gloom, end quote, spread over Kalispell as the town worried that it would become nothing more than a wide spot on the road, like so many other ghost towns created by the railroad's departure. Thankfully, Kalispell did not shrivel up and die like its townspeople feared it would. Although even today, more than a century after the division point moved from Kalispell to Whitefish, it seems as if Kalispell still holds a little bit of animosity towards its northern neighbor, even if it only plays out in high school gymnasiums. The changing map of the Great Northern through Northwest Montana, and indirectly the fortune, fate and fortunes of the communities along it, has been a major focus of my photography in recent years. Like I said, after graduating from the University of Montana in 2011, I moved north to the Flathead Valley for a job at a newspaper. Before I'd even unpacked my car, I began making regular trips to Marias Pass to photograph BNSF's dramatic battle to climb and conquer the Continental Divide. Marias Pass has long been a popular destination for, for rail fans because of its stunning scenery, part of which runs through Glacier National Park. The historic record shows that James J. Hill saw the mountains of Montana as nothing more than an obstacle but his son, Louis, saw them as an opportunity to fill passenger trains. The younger Hill had become an ardent supporter of the establishment of a national park in Northwest Montana. And according to legend, Louis Hill actually twisted some arms in Washington, DC to get the park created in 1910. Once the park was signed into law by President Howard Taft, Louis Hill and the Great Northern immediately got to work developing the park and its surrounding landscape. In the 1910s, the Great Northern built two massive hotels in the park, including this one on Swift Current Lake in the northeast corner of the park, as well as a number of backcountry chalets. The accommodations were meant to enable visitors to be engulfed by the wilderness while still being within reach of the amenities of modern life. Although he was still president of the Great Northern, Louis Hill spent much of the decade focused on the developments in Glacier National Park. Hill allegedly picked the exact location of each and every chalet in the park and even cared about small details like what type of soap would be stocked in the hotels. Louis took his work in Glacier National Park 
so seriously that he once told a confidant that, quote, the work is so important that I am loath to entrust the development to anyone but myself. For that reason, I shall give a major part of my time to the park. And in another story about Louis Hill's involvement in the park, according to legend, Louis Hill went into the mountains of Montana and actually picked the berries, the, the of red berries that he would send to the White Motor Company to build the, the red buses in the early 20th century. And he sent those berries as an example of what he wanted the buses painted. According to some accounts, the Great Northern Railway would spend $10 for every $1 the federal government spent in Glacier National Park in the 1910s, although some historians have disputed that figure. Doing photography, railroad photography, along Mariah's Pass is not without its challenges. For one, it's a very remote area that just so happens to be home to one of the largest populations of grizzly bears in the lower 48. So if you happen to be there doing some railroad photography, I highly recommend getting a can of bear spray and knowing how to use it. Thankfully, in my eight years of nine years of rail fanning and hiking in Glacier National Park, my run-ins with bears have been few and far between, and I haven't had to use it yet. Perhaps the best part of photographing trains on Marias Pass is trying to capture the rare against the changing seasons. The landscape is constantly evolving, like in this photo from 2017. Beargrass flowers are commonly found in June around Glacier National Park and in other parts of the Northwest, and they were particularly abundant this spring in 2017. In fact, many people who have lived in the area for decades said it was one of the best blooms they had ever seen. When that happened, I spent an extra amount of time looking for images of the railroad that reflected that bloom. The weather can also change in an instant. I took this image of the Empire Builder just last week on what had been an otherwise foggy and cloudy morning in Corum, about 20 minutes west of, or east of Whitefish. Departing Whitefish, the train had locomotive problems, thus delaying it about an hour. That extra hour resulted in the sun having just enough time to burn off a little more of the cloud cover, resulting in this nice, somewhat brighter shot of the Empire Builder coming through Corum, with the fog obscuring the mountains of the Flathead National Forest in the distance. As I noted earlier, though, BNSF is not the only railroad in northwest Montana. In fact, the long diminished branch between Columbia Falls and Kalispell, which was once the main line until 1904, still sees trains every week. Watco Company's Mission Mountain Railroad was created in the mid-2000s after BNSF decided it no longer wanted to operate two different branch lines in northwest Montana, the one between Columbia Falls and Kalispell, and another stretching from Stryker to Eureka, another piece of the former Great Northern Main Line that became a branch of the creation of the Libby Dam in the 1970s. I began photographing the Mission Mountain shortly after my arrival in the area in 2011. Of particular interest to me was the trackage through downtown Kalispell. Although part of the yard was ripped up Although part of the yard in Kalispell was ripped up to make way for a shopping mall in the 1980s, the remaining track through town offered a taste of urban rarity that you don't often find in Montana. It also didn't hurt. The newspaper I worked for was literally a block from the tracks. Over the last nine years, if it was nice out or if I heard the train go by while I was at work, I would try and come up with some sort of excuse to leave the office. I would tell my editor that I had to go down to the courthouse to pull documents or something so that I could get a few shots of the train. It didn't take long for my coworkers to catch on to this scheme. However, in the last few years, those trips to the courthouse or city hall to take pictures of the train took on a sense of urgency. For years, the city of Kalispell had dreamed of ripping up two miles of track through downtown to make way for a trail and commercial and residential developments. That plan got a major boost in October 2015 when Kalispell received a $10 million federal grant to build a new rail served industrial park east of town that has become the home for the final two rail customers in downtown Kalispell, a grain elevator and a drywall distributor. In early 2018, with the blessing of my editor at the newspaper, I began spending even more time photographing the Mission Mountain through downtown Kalispell. In March 2018, I spent a day with the crew of the Kalispell Local 
as they switched cars on the 13 mile line between Columbia Falls and Kalispell. I've long been a fan of the work of photographers like Blair Koistra, Ted Benson, and John Gruber, photographers who focused on the people rather than the locomotives. Of course, I came of age in the years after September 11th, when railroads became considerably more suspicious of ha having someone hanging around with a camera. Because of that, the opportunity to interact with railroaders, much less photograph them, is exceedingly rare in 2020. Thankfully, the management of the Mission Mountain Railroad was very supportive of this project, realizing the historic importance of what was about to happen and allowed me to go literally wherever I wanted to go throughout the course of this effort. However, I wanted to make sure that this project was about more than just the railroad that came through Kalispell and was also about the people and industries that supported that railroad. So I soon began stopping by the grain elevator in downtown when they were loading covered hoppers and visiting the local drywall warehouse. Just like the people on the Mission Mountain, the management at the grain elevator and the drywall distributor were incredibly supportive of the project and never once shooed me away when I visited. They always said the same thing, don't get hurt. I was even there for a few mishaps, like this one. Normally, the elevator crew would open the bottom of the covered hoppers to get any old grain out before loading. But on this day, it turns out the previous customer had left about half a load inside the car. The manager asked that this shot not go, up, go in the local newspaper. I also spent time at the drywall distributor near downtown and on one cold day, photographed the process of unloading a single center beam flat car, including the process of picking up the leftover wrapping and shipping material. If anything, this morning was a great reminder that rarity is about so much more than just locomotives and freight cars. Thanks to my job at the newspaper, I also had the chance to cover some of the events associated with the construction of the new rail park and the planning of a new downtown trail, including this view from about two summers ago when local officials were touring the rail yard to get ideas about what could be developed there. And the driving of a golden spike at the new industri rail industrial park in 2018, even a century and a half after the a golden spike was hammered into the rail or ties at promontory utah a gold spike is the only way to finish a railroad although i'm quite positive that this one was just spray painted gold when i first put this presentation together for the center for railroad photography and arts conference in march 2019 the mission mountain railroad was still running into downtown kalispell with some regularity while the final two customers a grain elevator and a drywall distributor were putting the finishing touches on their new facilities at the rail park east of town. In early fall 2019, the Mission Mountain delivered its final grain train to the elevator downtown. The drywall distributor took a little longer to move into its new home and was getting loads, down loads downtown until December. Knowing that the last run was near, I began to bother both the railroad and the warehouse manager on an almost daily basis about when the last car would come. And every morning as I drove into work, I'd glance over at the spur to see if there was a load sitting at the ready. Thankfully, both the railroad and the warehouse manager understood the historic nature of the event and were generous with their time and information as they had always been. On December 13th, 2019, the Mission Mountain would deliver what would become the last load of freight to downtown Kalispell, Montana. TR-874519 was loaded in Himes, Wyoming, and was unloaded at Northwest Drywall in downtown Kalispell on December 14th. A few days later, the Mission Mountain came to town to retrieve the last empty. A week later, on December 27th, 2019, the Mission Mountain sent a train downtown one more time to retrieve a cut of tank cars that had been pushed to the end of the line for storage. Before hooking up to the cut of cars, the crew stopped to take a few photos. Afterwards, they picked up the cars and headed east towards Columbia Falls. The final run through downtown Kalispell came just a few days before the 128th anniversary of the Great Northern's arrival in Kalispell. 
As the final train pulled out of town, a city official who had helped spearhead the effort to build the new rail park east of there mused, quote, when the railroad came to Calspell in 1892, it was the beginning of a new era. Now, as the railroad leaves 128 years later, another era is set to begin. In early 2020, developers began to bring down the old grain elevator. Weeds are now growing up between the rails that are expected to be ripped up later this year or in early 2021. And I plan on shooting the removal of the tracks to bookend my ongoing photo project tentatively titled The End of the Line. Although in recent months, the scope of that project has changed dramatically. In March of 2020, BNSF Railway informed Watco that it would not be renewing the lease of the 13-mile Kalispell branch, what remains between Columbia Falls and Kalispell. While the Mission Mountain will continue to operate a branch further west near Eureka, BNSF's decision to retake the Kalispell line has dramatically impacted the Mission Mountain, which had to let go of more than half of its employees as a result of the change. Thankfully, most of those railroads, railroaders have been able to find work at other Watco operations. On April 1st, 2020, BNSF Railway resumed operations on the Kalispell branch, although signs of its return could be seen in the days before the official takeover date. A subtle reminder of just how fortunate I was to have the type of access I did over the last few years while shooting the Mission Mountain. The change in ownership or change in operation was a reminder that the story of railroading in the United States is still being written 151 years after the Golden Spike was pounded into a wooden tie at Promontory, that decisions made in boardrooms thousands of miles away can still impact communities all across the country. What hasn't changed, though, is the stunning scenery in which the Great Northern Railway traverses in Northwest Montana. In fact, that scenery has become an even greater focus of my own photography this year, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. While I absolutely love to include people in my photos, that's been tough to do that, to do in an era of social distancing. So I've refocused my attention on what, a first, on what first attracted me to this area. Earlier this year, I even got a drone, something I thought I would never do. For the longest time, I thought that a drone was a lazy man's tool. But when the pandemic hit, and I realized most of my photography would be local this year, I decided to get a flying camera to at least give me some sort of reason to get trackside locally. In recent months, I've really come to enjoy the new angles that it opens up, such as this view in Whitefish taken just a few weeks ago. Whitefish Lake is one of the central figures of the community, and yet it's almost impossible to get a good photo of a train with it. But thankfully, that's changed with the drone. In this view, you can actually see above the, probably the fifth or sixth car, you can see Whitefish City Beach just above on the far end of the lake. I've also continued to photograph what remains of the Mission Mountain Railroad, specifically the 23 mile branch from Eureka to Stryker. As noted before, this was once the main line until the 1960s when the creation of Lake Kukanusa and the Libby Dam forced the Great Northern and Burlington Northern to build the Flathead Tunnel. With the completion of that tunnel, the line from Libby to Eureka was abandoned, but the line from Eureka to Stryker, where it connected to the old main line, became a branch. In 2005, this was spun off to Watco's Mission Mountain. However, unlike the Kalispell branch, which was leased by, to BNS, from BNSF, this line is owned by Watco, thus assuring its survival as an independent railroad. Today, it primarily hauls finished lumber from a lumber reload in Eureka and stores cars. The railroad is down to just three employees and usually only runs once or twice a week. A few weeks ago, I followed the local around on its weekly run as an epilogue of sorts to my earlier project about the Mission Mountain between Kalispell and Columbia Falls. Although the railroad's fortunes have changed dramatically, it's still running and serving a few customers in that classic hard scrabble short line tradition. But change is even afoot on the main line. With the decline in ridership on Amtrak due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Empire Builder will be Amtrak's daily Empire Builder between Chicago and Portland and Seattle will be reduced to just three days a week starting next month. 
Unfortunately, a number of Amtrak employees will be furloughed because of that decision. In recent weeks, I've made an effort to photograph the Empire Builder as well, knowing that its future is never a sure thing. It's one of the reasons I continue to go trackside, even after living in the same area for more than a, for nearly a decade. What is normal and mundane today could very well be gone tomorrow, even on a modern railroad like BNSF's route over Marias Pass. And with that, I want to thank you for giving me the time to share some of my work with you, and I hope you enjoyed this part of the presentation. And before, you know, we can answer some, some questions about this type of stuff too, uh, but I figured that since this is the, the Rocky Mountain Club, I would share some, some other photos of a recent trip down to Colorado and Utah, um, just to, to mix it up a little bit. Um, this isn't part of the formal presentation, but I thought you might enjoy these as well. Um, in June, a friend of mine was getting married uh, on the Heber Valley Railroad, um, and so and I was officiating it. The wedding went from being a, a big, big, you know, 30, 40 person affair to just being, you know, eight or 10 people. And since it was going to be a, a small wedding, it decided to go forward with it anyway. And so I was originally going to fly, fly down there, but uh, ended up driving and turning into a bit of a rail fan trip. And so these are, these are a few shots from that uh, uh, towards your a little, a little closer to your neck of the woods. Um, left, left work early on a, a Friday afternoon and, and headed south towards uh, Butte, Montana or Silverbow, Montana and followed the uh, Union Pacific's uh, Silver Bow to uh, Pocatello, Idaho road freight uh, along the Montana subdivision. Union Pacific still uh, operates a line that runs from Pocatello north into Montana. And it's an incredibly scenic line, but it only has, you know, three round trips a week. And so, uh, you know, you don't see a ton of photos of it because there's not a ton of trains there, but uh, it is a really scenic and, and neat piece of railroad. Um, and so did, did that on a Friday afternoon and heading south. Uh, this is the, that same train coming down the south slope of Menida Pass on the Montana-Idaho border. Um, next day, stayed in, stayed in Idaho Falls that night at a, at a hotel. Most of the trip was... Uh, you know, staying in, staying in hotels or camping uh, and, and not going into any restaurants or anything, trying to be socially distanced and all that. Uh, so the next morning followed the Union Pacific's uh, Idaho Falls to Pocatello Road Freight. Uh, what's really cool about this part of the Montana sub uh, is that it still has, you know, older SD40-2s and it still has the older older style signals. Uh, it's really a throwback to sort of the 1970s or 1980s. And I've come to really enjoy it in recent years. After following that, headed south towards the Heber Valley Railroad. Um, as I said earlier, I'm originally from Maine. And so uh, long been a fan of the Boston and Maine and Maine Central. Recently, the Heber Valley purchased Pan Am Railway's two heritage Jeeps, uh, including this one, a former Boston and Maine locomotive that is uh, even though it's recently moved to the Heber Valley in Utah, has been uh, uh, has maintained its Boston and Maine paint scheme. Um, and so, even though the wedding wasn't on this day that we were going to be uh, we were going to be riding the train for the wedding, even though it wasn't on this day, I decided to go down early just to to get a, a shot of the this locomotive. Uh, next day, decided to spend some time on the Union Pacific Main Line through Echo Canyon. Unfortunately, this was the same day as that pretty explosive derailment out near Green River. So this was the, the only train I saw on the UP main line that day, but won't complain. I was able to get the, the classic Echo Canyon shot there at Echo, Utah, and then uh, shot chased it going up the Wasatch grade. And then that afternoon, headed back west towards the Salt Lake Valley, and was able to shoot the Utah Railways Provo to Ogden uh, Road Freight, RUT 611, and was able to shoot that at uh, Jordan Narrows uh, north of Provo. And then uh, finally crossed into to your, your territory and did the, the Deseret Power Railway in far northeastern Colorado and uh, 
east or sorry northwestern colorado and eastern utah and spent uh, a day and a half shooting the deseret power railroad i'm sure a lot of you are are familiar with it and, and have probably done it yourself uh really really neat piece of railroad one of the last heavy haul electric railroads in north america um it was just a a really cool railroad i love the fact that it's it's mostly through bureau of land management land so you can really go almost anywhere and just a really neat operation i haven't seen something like this before and then the uh the following day on on tuesday we headed back to the heber valley for my friend's wedding and uh was able to shoot one of the daily excursions which on this day had the uh, main central 52 uh, a locomotive that i shot back east uh back home in new england over the holidays a few years ago it's pretty weird to see it in in utah but you know i really i really liked this scene just because it sort of looks like coastal maine in some ways and then uh yeah we had uh we had a little bit of a train ride for my friend's wedding and uh got to ride in the cab of one of the gp gp7s and uh i think that's it that's uh that was that trip so there we go so yeah, if you have any any questions, don't don't hesitate to to yell them out. Sorry, Justin, took me a bit to get control back there. Oh, you're good. Um, <laughs> really appreciate the show. Fantastic photography, wonderful narrative to go with it to to really bring it uh, bring some meaning to the photos. So thank you. Um, I've allowed everybody to unmute themselves. Please use it wisely. But if anyone has questions, go ahead, unmute yourself, ask your question. And I'd ask that you go back on mute uh, when you're done. Where exactly is the Deseret Railroad? The Deseret is in far northeastern, sorry, northwestern Colorado and eastern Utah. If you go to Dinosaur, Colorado, yeah. You go just okay. south of there. Oh, south of there. Okay. Yeah. It's 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 way out there. Like huh? uh when I finish I get I shot the the Deseret runs like Monday through Thursday and I shot that photo of the Utah Railway on mm. Sunday evening uh at Jordan Narrows and was sort of thinking like, all right, well, Deseret, it's still in Utah. How far can that be? And then and that photo was taken at like 6 30 7 o'clock in the evening and i get in the car and i i put it in google earth because i'm staying at, at, at vernal utah and i was like oh it's about three hours away <laughs> so but really really worth doing it's the last uh last heavy haul electric railroad in, in the united yeah. states and uh it's, it's neat i've heard of it but never seen any pictures yeah, that was great not too far from rangeley oh, yeah okay. yeah at rangeley okay Coming in, out here. Uh, they're get, they're getting ready to shut down that Deseret, aren't they? That's getting they're running out of coal or shutting down the power plant. There was I've heard the 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 other heavy haul electric railroad, uh, the Black Mason Link Powell, closed about a year ago, and I think it was because the power plant was running out. I've heard that the power plant that the Deseret serves has a considerably longer the mine and power plant have a considerably longer uh projected lifespan but i mean that's right who, who knows uh if, there, if there's one thing i've learned in, in doing railroad photography it's it's don't take anything for granted and even if someone says like oh that's gonna be around forever it probably won't be <laughs> oh, okay yeah I, I got it mixed up so my my apologies oh you're good it was that other heavy haul. Yeah. 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 Sure. And uh, anyone else? Well, it wasn't clear on how, when they shut down the line to the, uh, the drywall in the green elevator there. Yeah. But they put in the new line so that that took the green elevator out of the picture. Is that That's what happened? Bad. Yeah. So, uh, and I've always, I've always, I'm always worried that I don't explain that right. But um, so the the branch from Columbia Falls, where where uh, where the branch split off the main line down to Kalispell, is 15 miles. The okay. last two miles of the railroad into Kalispell go right into downtown, or went right into downtown. It's still there now, 
but they haven't torn it out. But uh, what the city of Kalispell wanted to do was remove remove those two miles of track mm. and um, put a bike path. The argument is that you know the the rail line cut right through the middle of town, and that there's a lot of underutilized land along the rail line, and so for years the city of Kalispell applied for. Uh, tiger grants from the federal government finally got one in 2015 that would pay for a new rail park just east of town so now hmm. the basically the the branch goes right up to Kalispell city limits and it stops and there's an industrial park okay. and the um the the grain elevator and the drywall distributor um have built new facilities there and there's been there's space. Oh, okay. There's space so there. Business <laughs> no, no, they didn't go out of business. There's space there for actually a couple other uh, rail served uh, uh, industries there. I don't think they've filled up those spots yet. In okay. many ways, it was a good deal for the the end for the for the two yeah. industries because they got brand new brand new facilities. Uh-huh. The Mission oh, Mountain okay. Railroad prior to BNSF taking it back over was actually pretty stoked about it because they didn't have to maintain five crossings through downtown uh, Kalispell, which they didn't like to do. Um, of course, yeah, then <laughs> once the once the rail park opened, being at the lease of the line happened to expire at about the same time and BNSF decided they would take it back over. Oh, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, I mean, it's, it's one of those things. It's, uh, uh, you know, sad to see a little, it's an, it was a neat little piece of railroad. Sad to see it go in the grand scheme of things for, for the town and the railroad, probably a, probably a win because they get yeah. a new rail park and, and they get some space for, for redevelopment. Although the, the, the problem with the one thing really holding the whole, whole thing back is you have, a uh, U.S. Highway 93 goes right through Kalispell, and mm. while they want to put a bike path along the railroad there, you still have to get people across what is a pretty busy four-lane highway, essentially. Um, so it's not a perfect plan. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, totally. All right. Anybody else have any questions for J- uh, Justin? Just, just great photography, Justin. Having been out there a couple of times, um, yeah, you put your time in. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. It's a, uh, it's a great place to do photography, and it's uh, I've been pretty, pretty fortunate to have the chance to uh, explore it over the last ten years. Uh, it's yeah, it, there's always something new. Even when I, even when I think I'm, I'm tired of of shooting BNSF dash nines and and the same old, same old. There is always something something new the weather the weather uh will do something different or the foliage will do something different and uh even even after 10 years of, of shooting what i what i think are the same old same old uh i always feel like i do come back with something at least one good shot every time i go out and it's also just been interesting to see how how much the rare has changed in the last decade um you know i first went up to mariah's pass uh when I visit, I was visiting family here in Montana in 2005. And so the first trip I ever took to Mariah's Pass was in 2005. And I was recently looking at some of those slides. Um, and it's in, impressive just how much the railroad has changed in, in 15 years uh, from that first trip. You know, there was uh, manned helpers out of Essex, Montana uh, with SD 40s, um, you know, the, it's there's been a lot of change on the railroad, um, which is sort of the, the one constant in, in this whole thing. Well, we certainly thank you for your show there, Justin. And, yeah, absolutely. You know, when you when you have uh, another one you'd like to show us, let us know for sure. Will do. Thank you so much for, for having me. And uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. It was great. I know I did. Yeah. Cool. And uh, Good to see some different names out there. Uh, glad Jim Just is uh, tuning in with us and found his way to our Facebook page. Uh, 
I don't think our friend from uh, Australia is on this time. Yeah, it must not be tea time. Yeah. <laughs> We, we will have the announcement for the uh, October show coming up in the uh, newsletter pretty soon. And like I, I said earlier, uh, Ed Dickens is going to uh, present for us in November. And um, I guess that's about it. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, thanks for Justin. Thanks to Nathan for doing our technical directing. Anybody else have anything else? No, uh, just thanks. Thanks very much. Real good show. Great pictures. Beautiful part of the country. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. I'd never been up there, so <laughs> it was really neat. Yeah. All right then. Good night, all everybody. Right. Thanks for tuning in. Good night, all. Good night, everyone. See you next month. See you next month. Thank you. Yeah. All right.